Welcome to the Dr. Lou Jensen Show. Thank you for coming tonight, and we appreciate your participation. Sit down and have another little fireside chat, shall we? Today's going to be a fun one because there's lots of snow outside, and that wonderful fireplace just makes it so terrific in here. Good to have my sidekick along with me today, Chris. Say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. We're all here. We're all here. The crew's here. We're mm -hmm. we're doing our live thing and trying to put together a show. Can I have some more fun? Let's have some more fun. I'm going to yeah. call on you today to do a little carving and a little demonstrating. So, Sure. Okay. That ought to work out really great. What I hope for this to become is something that's more positive and more uplifting to you and your struggle with your own individual life and living. And I'm excited from the fact that it's going to start out from such simple beginnings. But if you're going to sit and watch this thing grow, I guarantee you, one day it's going to be a big right. deal, Hunkers. It's going to be fun. It's it's gonna sure. It's going to be fun to see how far it can spread. Aren't we getting some great responses <laughs> and reactions from people? Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's enjoying it so far. Yeah. So we'll keep leaning into it and see if we can't tweak it in such a way that it'll be really helpful to you individually. I hope as you see journey, our journey television up there and you see forward slash Craig Hone one day studio, Greg Woodard studio, then put your name up there as a master of something in our, in our I&E network program. I think it's going to be really exciting. I had a fun weekend. I went out and shot a class. We're teaching class on artistic design. Craig Hone put the whole thing together and we're doing it at the Hone Studios and and uh, later in the day, Keith called, his dad called and says, is Lou still there, Tammy? So he came in and presented to me what's called a talking stick. And if you can get a close-up, Gerald, of that face. I don't know if you can see that face really well there. Let's see if we can get a shot of what he's carved. Keith likes these little spirits, wood spirits. and oh, that's uh, so cool. Puts them on a lot of his things. Isn't that neat? That's cool. And then uh, the feathers are macaw feathers from why we were over there on a trip one time. And uh, Keith and I f fetched these out of a, we literally fished them out of a big ta uh, cage with the macaws in. <laughs> and they're such a spectacular feather. That's and he put a couple feather. of those on there for me. And um, then there's a message tied to it. And I want to read the message to you because it was just so fun to interact with Keith and Elaine. We've traveled all over Timbuktu together. We've been everywhere twice, and we've just had so much fun over the years. And I want to read to you the message of the talking stick. The talking stick has been used for centuries by many uh, American Indian tribes as a means of just and impartial hearing. The talking stick was commonly used in council circles to designate who had the right to speak. When matters of great concern came before the council, the leading elder would hold the talking stick and begin the discussion. When he finished what he had to say, he would hold out the talking stick and whoever wished to speak after him would take it. In this manner, the stick was passed from one individual to another until all who wished to speak had done so. The stick was then passed back to the leading elder for safekeeping. Some tribes used a talking feather instead of a talking stick. Other tribes might have a peace pipe or a wampum belt or a sacred shell or some other object which they designated the right to speak. Whatever the object, it carries respect for free speech and assures the speaker has the freedom and the power to say what is in his heart without fear and without reprisal or humiliation. Groups of school children are said to also commonly use talking sticks in their circles as well as adults and, and uh, business groups across many cultures in the world. That pretty cool, yeah, isn't that's it, Chris? Neat. That is really neat. Um, his wife, Elaine, we were sitting there visiting about it and how neat it all was. And, and Elaine, uh, she says, I've asked Keith to make me a shut up club with no. a, a club with a stick with a stone in it <laughs> and so we're going to have a matching pair here before long <laughs> one's to talk and the other one's to to gradually shut up make you shut up isn't that a fun thing that is way cool i like that the part of what we're going to talk oh, about today in the show today is got something to do with the spirit of that stick because keith's heart and soul is is embedded in that effort and that work effort 
And that peace is going to outlast our lifetime, isn't it? Oh, yes. And this is a treasure. This is this is something you'll hang on to. For, so for, significant. Longer than you'll be around, like I mean, you said. I mean, I just couldn't get over when I held it, the difference in the feeling. Uh, it's not just a walking, talking stick. It's a, it is a treasure. It is a treasure. I mean, from such a neat guy. Yeah. I've never been able to meet him, but I have a gun that he carved, and yeah. it's... Yeah, it's you one do. of my one most of his, favorite treasures as one well. One of his so. famous heirlooms, don't you? <laughs> I do. And I treasure it. Well, what we're going to talk about today is the concept of finding and doing with those inspirational moments, those things that hit you. I, I just can't get over when we're supposed to do things, we often don't do them. You know, we okay. we just know later after the fact you suddenly realize oh, I should have wish I hindsight's could've. always better. <laughs> yeah. Hindsight's and so always I got a, I had that magic moment when I was cutting that trench for the electricity last week. Remember? Mm -hmm. I remember yeah, that. All right, yeah. let's go. Let me show you a real learning moment for me. Do you know what? This represents one of those times in life where that shoulda, woulda, coulda kind of thing, you know. I had all day yesterday to go get this machine and get, I've got to dig a trench for the electricity to come from the house out to the studio now. And it's got to be done so that I can get it inspected and be done with all of this construction stuff. And I had all day yesterday to go get this thing and give it a try. It was a beautiful day yesterday, and then it snowed last night. And now it's cold and windy and weather and... Oh, crap. Isn't that how it goes? But this is a machine. This is another digger tool that I've never used before. So we're going to see how it works, okay? That makes it go... it up and down. Oh, I'm learning. Yeah, I know everything there is to know. <laughs> Let's grab a rowboat and go to Hawaii, shall we? <laughs> Isn't that a fun that moment? Was cool. <coughs> I, the part that's so surprising to me is when people don't look at themselves closely enough or introspectively about those learning moments and that's kind of way way it was last time remember when we talked about the ship captain who was arguing with the lighthouse mm -hmm. and 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 yet it's fun to look and say well that's what the experience was for them but what are we supposed to learn out of that why is that such a significant it always raises a laugh in most people is because i think we've reacted the same way oh, always in similar circumstances we get our we get our minds made up and we're not going to change it we might be wrong but we're not going to admit it and we don't want to change yeah we never we never make it's not mistakes. my problem it's yeah. somebody you, you else's problem you get to deal problem. with it yep um this sign was lettered out for me when we just barely got the company started. And it's been such a significant part of my life. It's hanging up there on the wall on the ceiling here in the studio now. And Jim Griffiths did the hand lettering for me. But it really is such a strong concept. It's kind of my whole life. And as you begin mm -hmm. to watch this unfold from such simple circumstances, when we took a two-bit eggshell and turned it into a five million dollar a year company and it just that period of time was the greatest time in my life but we were just rolling and it was having it was so much fun to find better and and more significant ways to make it work but it all started as a dream and that's what life is about is following your dream i think and it's the it best happen. part of life anyway that's what makes life that's what makes you want to get out of bed in the morning is exactly. that you got to have a dream to Exactly. If it never, even if it never comes true, you gotta have one that you have something to hold on to. I have one. I've always wanted to ride the full length of the Rocky Mountains, oh, really? and I'll never get to do that. Well, but it's still a dream that I can think about. And maybe we can drive it in a four-wheel drive. Oh, I wanted to do it on horses. Yeah. But you know, and, but and it'll never happen. 
but it's still fun to think about. It's I've a been great up dream. I've been up there a few times on my horse, so yeah. it's really cool. Yeah. If you ever get a chance, you need Continental to do it. Continental Divide is oh, a pretty man. amazing thing. I've been across it once in the truck. That was fun. Yep. When we started trying to help coach people with this process, instead of just handing you a kit equipment package and turning you loose, I eventually came up with my own uh, apprentice program of helping people figure out what to do and how to do it and basically take it one step at a time, both with how to make it as, as well as how to market it. Mm -hmm. And so most of this show here is going to be involved with that uh, directional of getting a business plan started, taking your life from the dream stage that I talked about on the seven mountains, mm -hmm. the dream, and then come up with a map and a plan and then gather and prepare everything that you need. You're in the gathering, preparing stage right now, aren't I you? I am. You're very yeah. much so. Then we're going to have a f significant launch. Okay, that next mountain is the line in the sand that says my life's going that way from now on. And then we take on the journaling or keeping track and measuring and seeing how we're doing. Then we take on creative problem solving because that's all a uh, great hobby business is, is solving problems, I think. And then we're going to go from there into the sharing stage for the rest of your life. And I want to talk to you a little bit about being out of balance to begin with. And that's good for me because I'm, I'm out of balance, <laughs> out of balance. quite often. <laughs> well, that's probably why you and I get along so good is <laughs> we're, both, we're both strained the gears here. Uh, look at your life a little bit right now and see if this kind of represents your own individual life. If there's a toe chain between you and getting the job of life done, every link of the chain represents a human characteristic. And some of our characteristics, maybe it's time management. Maybe it's money management. Maybe it's relationships. There's something in most people's lives that Everybody are has talent. quite strained. Yeah. And so what we're going to try and do in this 50-week period is take on those things. Work on your strength, but take a care of the things that aren't quite so good. So this list is in my book, uh, Opportunity Intersections, The Business Plan. And these are the seven great characteristics of a quality lifestyle. So as I read each one of them, try and measure a mental perspective of a percentage. How good? Here's some good health. And I always call them my some good list because I don't think anyone has them all nailed down. And so it's some good health, some savings, and a better than average income. Some core, basic core values, wisdom to live by, a good family and good friends some travel that makes life and living so rich, a talent to discover, develop, master, and share, and something to be really passionate about, and finally a great place to live and grow your own version of paradise. You're and dead. in my case, You're it's dead. my own wonderful, oh man, do I love being out here, Chris. You do. Yeah, I put my fire on and I'm just gone. I can just play out here from now on, I think. Isn't it exciting to think we're going to take this 1,000 square feet and drive it all over the world? Oh, I think it's, just I the, just, it's uh, amazing to see how The challenge of it just motivates me no end. Because I think, I think it's going to be like a tidal wave. I think when it finally hits everybody, and, <laughs> and it's gonna, ev there's going to be a part of it that's going to hit a nerve with anybody that takes the time to listen to it. Uh, so and many people, all we get is just this storm of negativity ne all negative. the time anymore. And I go, where do you go to get a shot in the arm and a holding a hand of somebody that's like-minded and that cares a little bit about whether your life sinks or not, yeah. you know? It's but important. if we go back to this, um, this aiming your life part, which is probably the core of my own doing, if you don't have something to aim at, then any road will do. You never so hit the trick is to figure out exactly what are you going to do with this next period of time. And it's usually the next 10 years is the most precious there are. Now, I do a lot of president's uh, sessions, training programs all over the country. And whenever I gather INE members together and we get to visit for a day or two, uh, the two problems in most people's lives that prevent them from getting to a profitable hobby or something that they can, a magnificent obsession that they can chase with the rest of their time. The really interesting part is uh, the trouble for all of them is money, not enough money and not enough time.
okay isn't that amazing that makes that's, sense. that's constantly what it what it really is and so what we're trying to do is take those two concepts on and see is there something that could inspire you and light a fire if you watch these shows regularly or go through them what you're watching for is that moment of aha that hits you that says oh my good lord i can do that i got a great call a couple of days ago from a guy that was in the last show and when i had done that first eggshell in that premiere show he said my good grief he said that just lit a fire in me that just won't quit and i'm going okay then stoke the fire let's yeah. let's do something How do we with make it. that fire go let's don't just grab the inspiration and then not do anything with it because in the next 50 years little tiny changes could start to really torque your life and produce all kinds of magical results well, let's let's show them another trick, okay? All right, the, the, all right. the engraving carving sessions we're doing in each of these shows now are going to be start from basics and move from simple stuff. So for those of you that are wizards with that ultra high speed hand piece already, I apologize a little because it's pretty simple stuff, but it's where we got to start. And I'm mostly aiming these first shows at people who've never seen us before, don't know, don't have a clue who Profitable Hobbies or Lou Jensen is. So we're going to start with some pretty simple stuff, but I think I've invented the coolest tool in the world. Everything from an eggshell. I mean, think about it. Most tools are wood tools or metal tools or glass tools. They don't cross over to other mediums very often. But to take something, Michael Thane carved this for me quite a long time ago, and to do all the power detailing of the surface, the entire eggshell was just a magnificent thing. But all the way from that to tempered steel, this was a knife done by Van Tishner Advance, one of our masters in our program. Oh, that's beautiful. I, I like that. that. Gorgeous thing. Okay, that's one project you got to That one, I got to show you how to do you that one, too. You got to teach me how to do that one, Okay. Too deal along with the other things on my all list. the 900 other <laughs> things on our left right that one might have just moved up a ways though now everything from from eggshell to 440 tempered steel the thing that's so amazing about what we can play with is we usually can carve and mark and engrave on finished surfaces and mm -hmm. normally you don't do it that way so we've just kind of reversed the whole process of making things normally a knife maker will make the knife he'll he'll have soft steel engrave the knife, temper the blade, and then put the knife together and just pray that the customer That's, likes yep. what's on there, you know. Yep. And we don't have to. We draw the customer into, we can put it on the hardened steel and finish the blade and draw the customer we, into the graphics that, that are on their knife. Because it's, oh, it's yeah. the customers, they know what they're going to get on there before, they, before you put it on. Yeah, much, much better way, better way to handle the whole thing. Uh, Gerald, can you come in and and pick this up? A pretty tight shot of this knife blade. This is one that I did a while back, and I think you can see it from about that angle right there. Come in a little closer to. Good. Wow, that's just about right. Now. To be able to put something like that, this is a pattern I teach in one of m in my Get Started Studio Started mm -hmm. course. This isn't something that's only for the gifted few. This is where yeah. we actually can start. And they see what I've done so far. Yeah. I mean, I am not what you'd call real gifted. So it's been, but it's been fun. Well, but you got it. We all start the same place. Yeah, that's what's and cool. And too many people back off too soon. They just don't realize that. What you've got to do here is wade into it, win, lose, or draw. That's and the, the more thing. you do it, the better you're going to get at it, and the more exciting you're going to get well, on, the, think, on the process. Well, I think that I can, in time, and it's going to take a little time, but I can get to be a master, mm -hmm. and I can have I can have my own studio, and I can have, you look at the carvings like this walking stick, and I can, I wouldn't even know where to start with this right now. No, but you give but me a you can bit of learn. Time, you a can learn. Practice, and I can do this. And and, that's and, what's cool. and the uniqueness of what we do, we I don't like. If it can be copied easily, then there's no advantage in the marketplace. The really exciting thing is when you do what almost no one else can do. I got a chance uh, last week to catch uh, the third mountain again with the clouds surrounding it and a little less weather than than the second show. So. 
this is the gathering and preparing stage and and unless you go through that effort uh, and sense that it's okay to go through that period of time you got to get everything together that you need and then go after becoming unique some skill something that you do that's just no one else does it and the problem with most of us in our life is we all think that the we struggle we about kill ourselves in that growing up social maturing period of our lives to belong mm -hmm. and and have this I think about it all the people that buy a BMW or a Mercedes and it's mostly because everybody yeah, else has that OMT. particular kind of a car and the same clothes and we make the same trips and our kids go to the same school we just knock ourselves out to to belong and to avoid going after what i think is the really strength in your life is that own individual uniqueness the second you start really thinking for yourself most of society reacts negatively Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it's that responsibility card dropped right on your shoulders. And so most of us would rather someone else did that thinking, the serious thinking for us and the serious decisions like for us. Like leaving dental school, like dental work. Like leaving dental and school. Becoming okay. a... And when I talked about the Flint and Steel fire building story uh, that's affected my life so much, man, to be able to see that in yourself and to spot that not so good things in our lives that begin to really raise Cain with those seven factors that are really significant in having a quality lifestyle especially as you're maturing mm -hmm. and so learning to do what we ought to do when we ought to do it instead of waiting a day too long <laughs> to go yeah. get that digger machine uh, that's just so strong in life and yet somehow what we got to do is get above that I came up with the word. I've composed all, pushed all the words together to call it Jolly what you ought to do. You've heard me use it a lot, uh -huh. Chris. And what you ought to do is, is a moment in your life when normally someone else says to you, you're good at this or you're good at that. What you ought to do is more of that. It's a reflective signal. It's like I call it my mirror sign. It's when it comes at me from an angle that I'm not paying much attention and all of a sudden somebody's saying you know what you ought to do is this this or this boy that's a serious time to pay attention okay mm -hmm. and and if you start sensing that you really like wood you know in my course this class I'm teaching you we're going to cover all kinds of different subjects and I'm I normally, excited I normally do it in one week but we we kind of spread it out yeah, and recording well. Chris is I'm gonna share this with all of you so we're recording it and spreading out a little bit but the thing you want to be careful with are concepts that would gradually drag it right back into work and we don't want to do now this is fun this ain't work I read I read an article in the magazine recently about a guy that's got a 9,000 piece shop per year little little space like mine and he runs 9,000 pieces of something through his shop every year and he's really proud of that fact yeah, but that going, sounds like a lot of work to me. <laughs> that's just work. That's a lot that of work. That can't be a good way to, sp I'm, well, maybe. I mean, it's his choice. He's Depends doing it how the he way he it, wants to. But there's decisions like that, both with how to make it and then what are you going to do with it that really need to be significant. Yeah. So I want to take them and show them what we just taught you. We got, we got Chris started with some leaves. And that's where we would start just about anybody when we start playing with wood and then we'll gradually move from one thing to the next. Well, everybody, I'm going to start teaching Chris how to carve leaves and I'm going to kind of let you just drop in and catch some of this along the way. Is that all right if we let everybody peek sure. in too? Sure. <laughs> if you were going to start, to, we like to start with leaves because they're fairly basic in the art world but boy they can get really really gorgeous and I got some examples here I want to kind of I've been looking you. at those yeah. yeah some pretty exciting patterns those are cool here. but if you were going to start with it would you think you should start with the most complicated most difficult pattern I don't know if you do the hard ones first then you're going to lose interest and lose confidence and you're safe and yeah. you're going to be done so you have to kind of have a little bit of judiciousness like, to to look at it and say I wonder if that's somewhat complicated or quite a bit easier right uh -huh. there's basically three dimensions to things there's the one dimension which is flat okay like the lines we've been doing on glassware mm -hmm. that's one dimension then when we come and carve it either drop it into the surface 
of the material, we call that drop relief, or we carve it above the surface like this has been done. Okay. And then, then it's overlay or raised relief and, and drop relief for two dimensions. So the lines and then either further down or Bring it further up. up. Okay. And full three dimensions would be a leaf carved both sides all the way out, just like a leaf. So like this one right here? Uh, well, that one could be done that way, yeah. So that's 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 just that's that could be done that way. So how would you do that different? How would you do that one? Well, let me start you back with the simple ones first. Okay, because okay. just so I know where I'm shooting at. The complicated oh yeah, I'm right. sure it I'm is. Go, let's go through them all and give everybody a chance to see the samples. Okay, okay sure. Let's start with this close up. This is Jose Valencia's work. Got it in focus. That looks pretty good there. Uh, Jose's become quite famous for his spirals and his treatment and so these are modified leaves and spirals that are pretty aggressive and this would be something that I would say you know a good class 3 carving you really got to get some basics and beginning stuff in place first okay so that's okay. down that one's down the road so that's a little down ways. The road. okay then uh, a class 2 drop relief carving would also be something more like this this is another really famous Keith home pattern. I carved it out, but it's it's a design that Keith basically worked up, and it's one of our teaching processes when someone's trying to learn to do higher end furniture, particularly fireplace mantles and stuff. So this is drop relief. It's actually all the way down, but it appears to be raised relief and full, that, full near full relief. So that's because you've dropped the background down so, so far. far. Okay. Yeah. And we actually started at the highest level here on the wood and then routed this edge down here and then relief carved out the trough. Okay. So that's kind of how this one was done. This is another one of Keith's really famous patterns, Chris, and, and this is completely raised. It's an overlay that we cut out and then we glued it on, carved it in. Usually we carve it separately and then glue it on, but one of the tricks of our of our process is that we put in a textured background. See how that's been stippled mm -hmm. in there? And that deceives or tricks the eye into thinking that this is actually full. All full part wood. of the wood. All part of the wood. So it really, technically, it started out exactly the same as, as this piece has here. Okay. You see, if we outline cut this whole pattern here, we could make it this size, or we could make it this size, or we could go even larger. Now, so, to, so to start out with that, options. you still use the stencil film and make it regular, and then you just make it the size you want. Yeah. So basically, once you learn the steps, you can pretty much use the same techniques same on every on any surface you want to carve. Exactly. In last week's show on the television show, I talked about doing this part here, and I want to try and take you step by step from something quite simple up through what would it take to be able to then render something like this and so we can give everybody kind of a running head start at even some fairly complicated patterns. I want to show you Mary Hogue's work here. This is a gift from Mary to me and oh I love it. It's, it's uh, neat. It's actually the gourds left the seeds in so you get that rain, rain tube kind of mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. And then she put my favorite thing on there is leaves. And, and if you can see that she's done an outline drawing and then a relief, semi-relief trough around the outside edge to separate it from the surface that it's on. And then the real trick to high speed carving is that you can do this on the finished surface. So this was probably sealed and stained first and then the carving was done. So then you wouldn't like on the gun stock. You wouldn't have to do anything. You don't have to just lay the pattern stain, out and go maybe to stain the background is all, and then go to car carving. Yeah, carving. And so you reverse the whole process. You just make it so much quicker. Oh because man! Because it'll cut all these edges clear to finish. Isn't that a beautiful, That's beautiful neat. design? That is cool. I really, really like it. One of the one of the challenges to begin with is not knowing woods one wood from another, mm -hmm. and and yet you can kind of begin to learn. And one of the first things you do these lines in wood are always called grain, 
most people know that, but there's difference between open grain and closed grain. Wood like on a baseball bat and an axe handle or hickory That's and ash, grain. they're open and they're a lot harder to carve because of the grain. The grain is tough between yeah. them. Is that because you have soft points, uh -huh. soft parts of wood in between each one of the rings? And boy, if you don't know, you'll figure it out very quickly. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is rubber wood. I bought this panel. This is just a cutting board over at Walmart because they're so inexpensive. Uh, they're really nice to carve with, and they're they're finished. They're all done, mm -hmm. plain, sanded, and finished. So this surface is likely sealed here, and then this is that little leaf set that Keith designed. And so if you're going to say, well, I want to carve that, I've got a piece of alder here. This is an alder button that we hand out at all our shows that talk about us as a company and as a network. And, and so if we're going to carve that and put that on there, figuring out what to do and how to do it is what throws most people. And mm -hmm. so we came up with this pattern system. And this is clear acetate film that we use to make the patterns for our transparencies for sandblasting. Okay. Okay, it's clear acetate, it's overhead projection stuff. So you can literally just put it down on the surface and then what you can do is take a Sharpie, one that works actually, and come in. Oh, I would have thought we'd use the photosensitive mylar and do it that way. No. See, we can just go around right here and very quickly. Now, if we were going to do a lot of these, then we might take more time and do a whole set of them on a page and photocopy them and do the whole thing. But look how quick I can outline oh, sketch yeah. that guy, okay? That's cool. I would have never thought of doing it that way. All right, now, what that does is that oop, we got to get this little mark right in there too. That just separated it out really nicely for us. So now we've got something we can actually transfer the pattern onto the actual surface. Okay. Now the next thing we've got to do is, is transfer that pattern then onto the uh, photocopy material. This is the, the stuff that has the adhesive layer on it. Okay. So we're going to now, that's dark enough. You could put this underneath and trace it that way. That would be more difficult. You can't see it very well. Yeah. See, it's opaque, so it's a little harder to see. But this way, you can kind of read what's there. So all I do now is take that same pattern and trace just it trace it again. That's the cool thing about leaves. If you didn't hit it exactly, I don't know that that would be that. Yeah, big they're asymmetrical, of a so you just get close, and you're usually there's some things about a leaf that look good, and some things that don't. So there's parts of it you've got to render fairly accurately, and then parts that don't matter hardly at all. Okay, now you just take that pattern, peel that edge off, and stick that stencil right on that surface and it's repositionable so you can kind of get it where you want it and where you don't want it. It's just all but too big so what we could do is photocopy it or scan it the computer Make it a little smaller. change the size if we wanted to but it'll work for this demonstration just fine. Now when we did the glass we stuck the film on this pad to, to take some of the adhesive off of it. Do you mm -hmm. want to do that with the wood as well? No, it does, doesn't, doesn't matter. Wood grain, wood fiber doesn't stick very solid anyway. Now, if this was a, this is a raw surface, and this is a finished surface, so the pattern film would stick a little more, more aggressive here okay. than here. But on most wood applications, it just doesn't, doesn't matter. Have to, doesn't make any it's, difference. It's a semi-stick kind of surface to begin with anyway. Okay. Now, the first thing we're going to do is transfer that image onto the wood. So we've got to outline cut it, and almost 99% of the time, I prefer a 699, which is this long side carbide. Let me come up really close and show you. You can see the cutting flutes, this little burnt part right here, that 4 millimeters in depth is the length of the 699, and that's what does the cutting first. We're going to push it into the wood aways and score it in. 
it'll cut and burn at the same time because of the speed of the tool but that also then helps us to transfer the pattern. How far do we want to push it in? Half uh, not too or? far, just a little ways. You want to have a fairly consistent line. And when you put it in, you just push it in there and then trace the lines consistently. We're not going to sketch this on. We're going to just outline, cut it, and see how it goes, okay? Okay. All right, just force it in a little ways so you got a little bit of a bite. See right where I'm at here. Right there, yeah. And then just trace that line, keep it down in the wood waves. Good. I think it works okay. better if I pull it rather than push on it. Okay. So we're gonna turn it around a little ways. Maybe start up here and come back. Excellent. Now this is not a brand new burr. This is a really worn one. This is one I've used a lot. So come and catch that edge right there now and bring that come up that from side. his point here down and around to there. Because I've already done that first little part. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good. Now do the stem too. Around the bottom of the stem. Now you haven't done very much of this kind of thing. Very little. So <laughs> very little. You're pushing it a little bit, but you're getting a good start. But it's fun. I'm you get the little mark right in the middle there. That separates the two leaves. Excellent. Okay. It off. They came off in two pieces. Uh oh, we forgot half of it. Is there part of it we not done? There's two pieces, right here around the bottom. Yep, we didn't get. Okay. Either no. I didn't push hard enough, or no, we didn't get that done. So what can we do here? Let's put that pattern right back in place. There was another spot across the top we didn't get. Okay. Now come down around that edge right there and trace that edge on that half of that leaf. So I need to come back up in here, don't I? Mm -hmm. And then come down around here. And then there was right another there. pot. Right through there too, right? Come right through here. All the way up, I'll do it all the way up. Looks like that has been done. Okay, and there was and one other was spot. It? Where was the rest? Right in there. Right in that top little part. Right you know what? We should have been able to see that because you can kind of see where it's darker. Yeah. You haven't cut. Maybe so we're, we're just hurrying here a little bit too much. I think that's now got let's see what we got here. Okay, we got to do a little bit more right here. Okay. Yep. Now, the really neat part Pretty about good. it is when you get that done, it is good. That for a first time, or that one too bad. Pretty good. Okay, we started out with 699. Now we got to go pick out a burr, and the next cut we want to make is to define that outside edge. Remember on Mary's Gourd where that outside edge was cut? We call that a relief, semi relief trough. Okay. And we're going to go in and cut that outside edge. And I've got, I mean, the trick to all of this is figuring out out of these burrs, which ones, which ones do you use when? Okay. You know, and learning those burrs and which ones do what is the real That's process. half the battle. That's half the battle. 
Now I've got two burrs here. And you can kind of see them. This is a little smaller mm -hmm. round, and this is a little bigger round, okay? So the smaller one is at number four? And probably, yeah. And this is a number six. So, but this one's burnt, and it's really burnt a lot. So when I cut with this one, I know it's going to burn that too. Burn the wood as much as which cutting. Is, that's what we want more than this. So size-wise and the use of the burr is really going to be a lot smarter to use the... So the more you use them, the warmer. better they get. Actually, yeah. Okay. None of us throw them away. <laughs> we keep them all. You can't have too many burrs. I think it'll be fun to play with it. Yeah. Now, this one, we're going to not hold it up and down. We want to lay it more on its side so it will cut better. And all you do is go around that outside edge. Now come right up to the 699 cut you made and kind of clean that out. But can you see how it's actually burning it as it's going to? Mm -hmm. So it's doing so you want just to, and you exactly want to stay on the, I want And you do. want to stay on the outside of the line. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you do have to show me so and now, I'll do the other So now, don't bring hand. this, start this line a little bit ways in. And then just go like that. So now, just go around that outside edge. And okay, cut well, that just like that. And it works better if I pull it. Now, right here, it's really tight. How do you just just go right on around, around it? Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that we're cutting the background first makes the carving of the leaves themselves jump out and a lot easier to carve. And most beginners do it just the opposite again to make it hard for themselves to do the job. Excellent, excellent. Okay, now how do we do that where the two leaves are coming together where there's that little hole in the middle? Okay, we've got to kind of compose that now. Okay. Okay. All right, now 703 cuts on the end and the side, four millimeters. So what we're going to do now is a brush stroke, but I'm also going to brush oh. with the rotation this time. High speed tools cut both toward you and away from you, which okay. is unidirectional. It doesn't matter which direction you go, they just give you a different kind of look. And the center of this leaf goes up like that. Got a little bit of a very slow S curve. So this is like when and we did. And so now what I'm gonna do is start brushing it away from me. So this is like when we did my fish. This is cutting the, the grass and stuff around the edge mm -hmm. of the when we did the edge of the fish. Mm -hmm. And then I can shape it a little bit, give it some roundness and some texture, but I'm staying right on the edge of the tool and brushing it away from me and going right up that midline. How much pressure are you putting? Barely. Just a little. See how far up I'm holding the hand piece? Mm -hmm. I'm way up on the side of the tool. So, so you're very, very light more stroke. Gently. Okay. So now I've got that. My part kind of done there. Now I got to make my part look like your part. Well, once we get it, pretty good. Look pretty cool. Yep, we got it kind of, kind of roughed out to begin with. Now let's do one more thing to it. Okay. Okay. Well, what are we gonna do now? We're gonna put a carbide in and go shape it more like those leaves of Keith. Now with it, with the carbide like this, this big brand new round carbide. If we pull it toward us, it would cut really aggressive. So we're going to do a brush stroke here again and go with the rotation again. And you just go through and start shaping the leaves out with this, just about like we did on the edge of that. So why would why would you use why could why would you use a seven or three? Why didn't just, we just go we to could that? Just one? go to this. But I wanted you to see the difference in the two textures. Oh, okay. That's all it is. It's just two different, two different looks. So when I'm doing this by myself, I can do it whichever way I Either want. Either way you want. Yeah, it's just how you want that leaf to look. thing to remember, Chris, is that every touch you make does something. Okay. So you really got to back off. You're heavy handed and that's how most men are. We, we tend to hit it too hard.
So lighter is better. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got her carved out. Change the angle of the light a little bit so we can see how it turned out. And we've got the edges done really nicely. They're sharp and aggressive. We sanded the leaves a little bit. We could stain this with dark stain down in here a little bit now, and that would take really quickly on this raw wood. But this is end grain maple, so it's like cutting on the very end of the log, which almost no one carves on. And it's such a great place to start. So now you can cut, that, you can cut anything. Practice, yeah, it is. That's true. Practice and practice and practice. Okay, let's take on Mary's Mary's leaf next. Well, my buddy Chris, what do you think? That was a blast. <laughs> we had quite a time. I'm ready to go again. We just dove into the very first project. That, that was fun. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Turned out decent. It really did. For the now, first time, it was good. Yeah, we got a lot more to do. But oh, yeah. Great start. So now we're going to take on Mary Hogue's leaves, and I'm going to show you how to cut these okay. in two dimensions. And it's such a great pattern that I think you'll I think you'll enjoy doing that project really well. Good, let's go. I'm as ready. you as we do this, as we explore the whole week in training, what I'm looking for is the things that turn you on and thrill you the most, because every new project does that. It tends to excite you or discourage you, one of the two. I and don't so, I don't discourage very easily. Yeah, not very easily. So what we're looking for is literally what would you do given lots of time to do it the rest of your life what materials what kind of subject what kind of concept it's literally this whole artistic obsession thing that's what we're after and uh chris can can we talk a little bit about some of your physical struggles sure um all your life you've walked with canes uh -huh. walker haven't I you have, i have what they call cerebral palsy cerebral palsy okay and i've had canes or braces or walkers your I've had to have assistance walking my whole life. It it yeah. just blows me clear off the planet when I see how hard you work and how much you struggle to do what others could do so easily, and yet you've just always got such a great disposition, such a delightful person to be around no matter. Well, my folks taught me when I was just young I could do anything I wanted to if I wanted to do it bad enough. So I've always just... I don't have anything that ever gets me down. I yeah. have to go about it a different way than you do, like driving a car, for instance. I mm -hmm. use tank controls yeah. or something like that. But I can do anything I want to if I yeah. want to bad you enough. you got the greatest get things so done personality else. that I've ever met. And all of you, you watch these shows as this kid gets better and better. Uh, what a thrill. It's going to be the neatest thing in my I'm whole excited. life to have you I'm realize you, you can do it if you just make up your mind to do it. And the cool it. thing is if I can do it, anybody out there, I don't care what your physical challenges are. I'm not handicapped. I'm physically challenged. Challenged, okay. And I love to take <laughs> on a challenge. You aren't and challenged one bit, but <laughs> oh, it's amazing I have once you do the job. As, you, we, as we are looking at these options of all the stuff I'm going to share with them on the shows as well as what we're going to teach you, the thing you're looking for is the, this part that just lights this little internal fire. And it will always be the path that others probably wouldn't take. It is the path least traveled. It's the reason that old poem, when you see two roads in the forest, and I mm -hmm. took the one least traveled, and it made all the difference. Well, if you watch for that, these, these concepts, I think, come as little tiny whispers. One of the greatest ideas I've had in my life, thoughts, is that 2,500 years ago, Chris, there were four people alive who are your ancestors. Two men and Whoa. two women that were alive that, that period of time. So in Vitruvius's day, in Da Vinci's day, there's always at least four people alive at any given time that are your ancestors. And out of that RNA and DNA, they lived long enough to have a child, and that yeah. child lived long enough to have another child, and you think of the odds of that. I mean, the odds that somebody was alive all the way down to you. To me, yeah. And out of that comes not only just the physical characteristics, but I think the tastes, the spirit of it all, the flavors of what you prefer and what you like. I call them these threads of interest. Boy, it's so important to listen to that. That's that whisper that comes through all the time that says, what you ought to do, mm -hmm. Chris, is this or this or this. 
Now, if you mix that with a little bit of unique imagination, you and I, when we get talking, we can oh, really we have get a each other going, can't we? Yeah, we, <laughs> we? We can get each other cranked pretty good. Yeah, we get things wound up, and, and what you're trying to do is watch for those moments of inspiration. The things that I think is when, literally when eternity comes along to help you to find something, what could I do? Mm -hmm. I know that's a question you have a lot. Oh, yeah. Al's have, doing this, and Craig's doing I this, and Mary's doing that, and our whole talk, network's got something. I talk something to you going. every day. I mean, I get a thrill call. Well, who did you talk to cool today? And you tell me, oh, I talked to Darwin, or I talked to Craig, or I, and you tell me some of the things they're doing, and I think, God, that's, I mean, One I, I got to find something One like day. that that I can do. Yeah. Not only that, you only wake that up every morning, wound up, and know where you're yeah, going. Not what only you're that doing I can make life. money with it, but I can also m more important to me than the money is the part that I'm having fun doing it. Well, we're gonna because learn how to pay the bills and control yeah. the time. Both yep, those two things. Those two things. They're the things that everybody looks past. And I'm gonna share with you a Woody Searle, a Woody Searleism. Woody was my mentor, as you know, for know years Woody, when I first Woody. got started and. Woody was one of the most amazing people I've ever been around. And Woody said, if it's your dream that you're paying attention to, dream your life up as if it were a ranch. Put a fence around it and then ride that fence twice a day. Ooh. Ride that fence line twice a day. Why? So you can make sure the fence stays tight and you don't have any. Well, and the more you dream it, the more you pay attention to that fence, yeah. the, more, the more you're going to push it to make it happen. The idea that if it's your dream, no one's going to come along and hatch your Nobody's dream for you. Nobody's going to do it for okay? you. Nope. The whole trick to this whole thing is a constant attention to it. That's why, why ride the fence line twice a day and check on the value and how. I mean, if you had a ranch and you got a herd of, of your value up there, somebody can knock the fence down or steal a cattle or whatever, and every hour that it's not attended to. Like my horses uh, got out yesterday. <laughs> your horses somebody left got the out, gate yes. open. <laughs> so the participation, the involvement, the persistence, and the dedication is just unbelievable. And on top of that, then we're going to look for wow. unique combinations. I thought I'd show you this picture as a surprise. I like that. That's one. pushing leaves clear off a cliff, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to get there. Yep. Isn't that just a terrific thing to that's, see? That's fantastic. That should just motivate the hell Whoa. out of you when you say, well, I did this little tiny leaf carving on this little alder button. Yeah, and look but, when, but that look on what a gun stock do. or a tie tack. That would be the neatest looking slide. You know how much, uh, how many comments you get if you carve yeah, that and put reaction. it on a, on a bolo. I love to wear my bolo ties. I hate ties that choke you, so I wear yeah, my yeah. bolos. But if you had that on a bolo button. Let's do that. Let's that make would, a bolo. That out. would be cool. Make a really neat gift for your dad or something. That, that, all right. Be a great good. Let's do it. All right. I got a neat little test to wrap up today. I'm going to read you some quotes by uh, mostly Da Vinci that are very, very famous. And I want you to see if you can sense out of the last few shows that I've done. I've been teaching these webinars now for five years. And, and I bring these concepts back up because they're the people who basically launched this kind of an idea. But it should be pretty imperative or in, uh, um, observable by you that these are the concepts that really are important. These are the significant weighty matters in the rest of your life. I have long since come to my attention that people of accomplishment rarely sit back and let things happen to them. They went out and happened to things. That's true. Isn't that true? Yep. So you instead of yeah. sitting around complaining about all the things you don't have, you go pull it off anyway, right? Can't do anything about those, so you worry about the things you can change. And you've witnessed all the early tender beginnings of the INE Network and our journey television. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, if this one succeeds in flight, but I, and it will one But day. are you having fun doing it? Oh, I'm having that's the time the, of That's life. the most yeah. important part of it is I've enjoy dreamed it. of this for years and years, and now it's beginning to happen. Life's pretty simple. You do some stuff, most fails. Some works. You do more of what works. If it works big, others quickly copy it, and then you'll do something else. And the trick is doing something else. <laughs> that's, true. that's uniqueness. That's, yep, that's, that's true. what Da Vinci and Michelangelo were so great at. It's pretty hard to copy them, 
pretty hard to follow them. They were oh, so yeah. involved in what they did. <coughs> Excuse me. Ooh, I like that. The greatest deception men suffer with is their own opinion. <coughs> <laughs> I bring this subject up a lot because you don't know what you don't know. That's true. And if your opinion and your perception's messed up, you're going to have a tough time. I've been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Being willing is not enough, we must do. Miracle's in the doing there somewhere, mm -hmm. I think, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> Where the spirit does not work with the hand, there is no art. Mm. So the spirit of it all is, is so critical. It is. It's just huge that we actually figure out some way to take ourselves and do something with ourselves not just the willingness there's a spirit that goes into the creation fabrication of it too what if we've had the whole purpose of art wrong all these centuries that what art does is what it does for the person who produces it and that's, that's the most, its important, most important element I, I really don't wonder if that's not what it is once you've tasted the taste of sky you will forever look up. I don't know how you say anything better than that. That's as good as it gets. That's as good as it gets, okay? These are, the next couple were kind of fun. Carving's easy. You just go down to the skin and stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was Michelangelo's. Every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. That's, yep. And that's, the process look at your walk it's see. just what Keith did in the process okay mm -hmm. now I'm going to share with you on the end here this last few few minutes uh, what I'm starting is called my solid gold list um, if you can't see opportunity in what I'm going to show you in these next few slides then you need to sleep on it a little bit and when it finally hits you this aha moment I'm hoping you sleep no more. Then do something with it. Isn't that what Da Vinci That's said? What he did. Yeah. All right. There's a thing in the world called investment grade wine, ingress investment grade alcohol, and people are investing in really high grades of wine and alcohol, like you just almost won't even believe. Okay. He mentions here that if you'd invested a certain amount in Coca-Cola or in in Nasdaq and now you'd invested it in in this certain grade of wine if you bought it at seventy eight hundred dollars in two thousand and eight now it would be expected to be worth three thirty thousand dollars in the year two thousand eighteen and that's two hundred and eighty four percent gain i don't know anything you could do any better i don't know much better than that okay that's the solid gold and most people don't have a clue what we're even talking about a 1907 bottle of wine, $275,000. A 1787 Chateau, $160,000. An 1811 Chateau, 117. I always wondered how do they know which ones are the really, it must be the taste, but... Who, who would want to drink it? Who would dare open it up? I, I wouldn't, wouldn't drink it. <laughs> it would push you pretty hard, wouldn't it? I wouldn't. We had a guy in, in the network come and take our advanced classes, leaf carving in Las Vegas with Keith. He's from, from uh, Phoenix, Phoenix area. And uh, Mike asked me what to do with it. You know, once you've learned to carve the leaves, now what, what should I do with it? And obviously, it's one thing to make it, and it's a whole other thing to market it. So mm -hmm. I went through a checklist, and I'm doing a video, a complete video on what he did and how he did it to kind of make this pull off in his life. Okay. But he basically went and met some architectural design people, and all of a sudden this lady called up and said, my client in Scottsdale just bought a million-dollar bottle of wine. One million, million dollar bucks bottle for a bottle of wine. He's the owner of Hormel Meat Company. Okay. And she says he wants a casket or a box or a treasure box to put it to in. Put it in. Okay. So Mike called and he was so excited. Keith helped him design it. 
and then he did the carving and then I helped him price it and finish up the relationship and get paid for it and he just couldn't come up with a price he really struggled over the pricing like we all do mm -hmm. pricing is one of the most subjective we always think our work is worth as much as, is. as it really we is just, yeah no perception whatsoever so i asked him to come up with the greatest price he could think of and he finally got to ten thousand and i said oh mike no 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 this one's easily double that and then we offered him a three thousand dollar discount for a rights to use the story ongoing to help promote promote Mike's life and so from well, something so simple and yet something so profound mm -hmm. you just don't realize in the upscale marketplace what is going on because most of us don't play in that world at all we don't have any idea that somebody would crack a fifty thousand dollar bottle of wine for a party or for a dinner party at their home just I, because I they could. can I couldn't but they could they so. could and the really interesting parts when they spend that money at well, just moves the money and keeps it going. If he's willing to spend a million dollars for a right. bottle of wine, how much is he willing to spend to, to, to put in a treasure in chest in that around it? Exactly. Dollar bottle I mean, of wine. He'll be offended if it's ten thousand dollars. That's not enough. Okay, this is another of his carvings. He got to the point where he's extremely good at at doing personalization, mostly monograms and family heirloom type mm -hmm. pieces mm -hmm. for these uh, ex exotic boxes. But it's also really easy to get on television and to get articles done in magazines. And also we do a lot of fundraisers with uh, personalization of wine and these kinds of products. The big wine, uh, food and wine tasting festival over at uh, Aspen, Colorado. They have 40,000 bottles of wine there and like 30 chefs and they just, it's just one giant, great, big, rich person's party. That would well, be fun to go over that. you can't personalize and do what we did in the last show with what Erica does on <laughs> a bottle oh of wine. Uh, it's just, there's just no end out there. And all you have to do is use that habit that we talked about last week, that what-if habit, to help you sense what's out there. Yeah. You know, don't, don't look at it as if it can't work out. Look at it from the perspective, I think I could do that. I think I could learn to do that. And you if could. the interest there, then After why After what I did with that little round button, you could carve it. I mean, yeah, you no can question. do it. No, no question. question. You can learn. So the whole task of coming, the reason to come and participate, I'm going to have every week on these shows one lesson after another to help you to run your passion as a, high, as a business better. Make it work. Don't just say I'm not good at business or try and ignore that or hope and pray that somebody Don't be else negative. will come along and do it for you. Don't be Let's learn how to trade yeah. and how to do well in the marketplace, okay? Besides that, it'll be a fun trip. It'll be a fun trip. It now, next be. week, we're going we're gonna to show you doing the Mary Hoag's pattern and then how to do this carving on this that I did on my kids' journals. Okay, so I'm, gonna I'm ready. Let's go it's right now. All right. It'll be a fun session, so I think it'll be worthwhile sitting in and participating next for the next very next show. All right. Yep. I want to finish up with one last thought, and um, I think the world of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs had a great idea and changed the entire course of history. Mine hasn't bent the world's thinking that much, but what it, it has will. done is bent my own life dramatically and a few others along the way. And what he says about the future and how you face and go after these things, the part that, that if someone's telling you this is easy and it's no sweat and anybody can do it, it's not easy. The trick is to fall in love with it. When you're the person who's doing the work and it's thrilling your heart and you're getting more excited by the hour and that passion is coming from inside your own, it's your own energy, it is the fire within. Mm -hmm. And the better you get at it, the more that energy will sustain you when it isn't so easy. And I think the fact that the inspiration part of the i &E network is something you've got to do for yourself. I've never found a way to give somebody a pill that will help, that they can swallow and help fire up inspiration. Well, if there was, wouldn't there be a lot of Boy, people? Boy, I'd, <laughs> I'd have that bugger bottled in a heartbeat. But the other part we can do for each other is the encouragement. Yep. And that's what you do for me constantly. This oh, don't think well, you don't I've been do it for building me too. this whole building and getting this TV station thing and this network thing set up and ready to go. It's been 
a little more than I could even chew at times, and you've been extremely helpful in that whole process, Chris. Well, we're having fun doing it. We are. That's the cool part. Okay, give me the stick back. You've talked long I'll enough. Talk. Okay, it's my time. I'll talk next week. How's that? Thank yep. you for coming. Hang in there and keep going. I'm wondering what would be the single most valuable piece of advice you'd give us to even attempt to create some of the value that you guys have done in both your very impressive companies. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and it's totally true. And the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, and you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere when, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane. Right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work, and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. So you've got to love it, you've got to have passion.